Um, where do we start? It's a whole bunch of parts. Um, the main concept in Mannequin, it's like I said, not just an animation, but it's a fragment. It's, it's animations on a track. You can put them after each other. So you can sequence animations and treat three animations after each other as one. And you could put animations underneath each other, additives, overrides, and so on, and also treat that as part of the main package. You can, and I'm just going to show you now how you do it. So, what do we have? We have a complicated tool with basically two parts here. On the left side, we've got our browsers, a bit similar to, uh, to character tool. So, we've got our browsers. On the right, we've got our property views. In the middle, we've got our preview and our timeline section. And we're gonna use the timeline also to edit. I said the fragment is the basic concept, so I'm gonna create one. And to create a fragment, we also need to put it into a certain um, a label. We need to give it a certain label that represents the state of that fragment. So it's whenever we're doing animation in games, we're either we're in a certain state. We're idling, we're moving, we're swimming, we're aiming, we're shooting, we're doing something. And that is represented in Mannequin by what we call Fragment ID, the state. In other tools, like in, in Unreal, you've got state machines with states. It's, it's a little bit like that. And I'll show you how it works. So this new ID button here creates me one of these new Fragment IDs, states. You can make one, let's call it idle. It's a very simple example. And you can set up all kinds of details for the state. For our purposes, let's keep it simple. And we're just going to create one that works only on the full body. I'll come to this later, what this means, or Jean will. What it did, it created this little folder icon here. It's our fragment ID, our state. And now we can create a fragment inside of this, with a new fragment button here. This icon here is the fragment, the movie icon. The folder icon here at the top is the fragment ID. see now is the fragment is completely empty the, so the character is not doing anything so this is how we start out we see that this full body track is here and it's enabled I can start now adding tracks just like in track view to this scope we call it full body. I can add an animation layer I can start adding a key here which then is an animation clip and I can start putting actual animation on there what did we use as example right uh, Idle. 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 Okay. So just a very similar like track view, you see a key, you see the length of the animation. Um, so in here. There's also a very similar option here. I'm not sure if it's the same though. Nope. Well, yeah, kind of. A light multiplier. Um, yeah, construct crude, crude like normal. You can go to a frame display by clicking on this little icon here with the 1 2 on it. Is this click around in time. Sorry, um, is this the current state of the current build? This or is current, this the uh, advanced UK? No, this is the Novus build. Okay. So it's pretty advanced, but it doesn't have the some fixes with copy paste and all kinds of other little things and annoyances that they worked on. No, right. it's not in, but, uh, right. This has been used already in three, two projects, so three, four, five CCs. Right. Yeah, just the, the interface looks so much better when we worked then. You work on right, so mm -hmm. no, because it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> so everything <laughs> from, from the tracks, the visualization of the uh, mm -hmm. different uh, animation clips. Yeah, this went already through a couple of stages. First, yeah. the gradient, and now we flat the flat look. Um, so I got one animation here. Let's just try and play this right away in, in the game. Try more making looping though. Ah, looping. Okay. So, so here are the clip properties. There's a looping clip to me here. So you can start looping it. And it shows you. We 
can play with Sina Buddy, you yeah. have small cheeks showing you as well when the, the when the animation loops. You can play with Sina Buddy on the screen, but small cheeks. There is, I don't know who asked all, I think it was Bogdan, there is the playback speed, so you can start playing this 20 times as fast. This little clip. And so you can start hacking with your animation, start changing it, or your game designers can come in and start screwing around with your animations. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it a, oh, yeah. a, a static value, or is that uh, can be changed over time? Or? This is a static value. Yeah. I, yeah. There are ways to do that. It's a bit more complicated. This is a static value. Mm. I'm not going to go into the others. Um, let's play this in here. This is actually set up. If everything else fails, we can come back on this one. That's a good solution. backup uh, solution. But let's just try to do it ourselves. Um, this guy has to go away here. Let's add an entity. Now, normally you will be using game entities. Normally you will be using players and then AIs and so on and so on. And you need to talk to your AI programmers and figure out a way so that you can play animation and don't screw up the AI and so on and so on. You get a certain protocol and you need to talk to your animation program and so on and so on and so on. What we're going to do here is we're going to play with a very, very basic type of entity, which we create pretty much specifically for this, very much like an anim object which you can just play a mannequin animation on, and that's about it. And then you can make your own setup. It's not really something I would use in a game, but maybe it's good for background objects or anything else, or demos like this. You could use that for preview and stuff. Yeah, or, or prototyping animator, even, maybe. You could make set up future tests or things mm -hmm. like that. Where did you put it? Entity and anim. Anim. The first anim thing. Or the only anim. Only. All right, it's empty by default. It's like an animal object, so it has a couple of properties here you have to fill in. We have got our main setup file for mannequin, which is called the action controller setup, and it's the, 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 the controller definition here. So th this initial setup is typically done by a programmer. Uh, typically, the programmer is going to do like the core uh, thing of the core structure, and the animator is going to like mm -hmm. fill it in and add new context in there. We're not, we're not going to go through that set yeah. of numbers for another day. Uh, that we need fragment that you showed, we need to save it along with you and that's the idea. It's already there. It's, already, it's, it's already there. So well, right now it's in memory, it's not saved on disk. Okay. But mm -hmm. the that's the idea, right? Yeah, when you when you load something in there, it's actually going to you know open the file, but we have a cache, so all your changes are in memory. I mean, we don't, we don't have a cache, but everything you're editing is in memory, therefore when you refer to that thing, the system knows that okay. why they need to refer to that. But you also can use that in Fragment, right? Um, as a fragment. Can, uh, uh, in SDK, you can. I'm not sure we can in Nova. I don't moment. think we have it yet. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Which means exporting the properties inside the fragment, in Fragment, would work at some point, right? All the parameters steady that you show me, like the scale of animation. Being in Fragment and the fragment being in Fragment, mm -hmm. you can animate it. In no, not like that. No. Okay. Those parameters were not designed for that. Although it is no, a very interesting. I'm thinking about extending. If you yeah. can extend it like that. Yeah. The, there are ways. Yeah, that, there is something to yeah. be considered because mm. there are different approaches. You could say that you could say you want a fragment to be like an atomic block that you know is always been the same way, or you could want to parameterize it some more. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this could be like something to be discussed, but yeah, right, right now it's like static. Uh, so those properties, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there are ways already. We already did this in Rise and in Crisis Crisis Three to actually change how fragments behave at runtime, but that's done through another uh, way, so a backdoor. I don't. You will have some game code doing that, or some procedural clips are doing that. And we're gonna show you know, okay. some examples of that. So I set up the controller definition files for the action controller, so the standard mannequin setup of the character. What you also need is the database containing all the animations, all the fragments. That's this ADB file and a model. Objects, characters, 
what we're trying what we're trying to do here is put everything related to a character including animation in one folder something we didn't really do before but it seems to work out and it might make it easier to find stuff share stuff bundle stuff so I think it's a good idea so all our animations are in objects characters and then also animations no wait baby a CDF. There you go. Mm -hmm. Just got reminded that I need to reload scripts. Because we have small bugs, so you have to get them once. Okay. And now? You don't even need to go in game. You can just. Oh, you oh yeah. Now nothing is going to happen. Yeah. We just have an object now. But okay. Now I need to make a flow graph to actually do something with this object. Flow graph. Everybody knows Q. Magic button. When the game starts, I want to play mannequin fragment. Starts play on the graph entity. The fragment ID is idle. That should be. Let's see what happens. I enable this. It's playing the idle. So now this is actually telling Mannequin look for a fragment with the ID fragment with ID idle and play it. You can show the debug information while we're at it. That's MN debug. And then the entity name, and it can object one in this case. I think in the game you can have tab completion and there are yeah. other ways. But we might come to that later. Um, what you see here, this is the what we call scope, the part of the character in which on which you're playing fragments. This is the animation it's actually playing. It's probably you can't see it, it's this rifle alerted stand idle. Here is the name of the fragment ID, which is idle. And there's more information we get to later. So if I stop it, it will, this goes away. If you stop it, then it just says no fragment, no action. Now we can. Can you blend between fragments? You yeah. Can run. yeah. 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 And uh, it would be hard to, to do that uh, request for working. Okay see what is sampling and what. They, they don't really have the same uh, oh, like the tonic structure. Okay. Yes, right. Right. Cool, thanks. Are we missing somebody? Yeah. Or did Evgeny just uh, yeah. uh, yeah. 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 left? I think it just did a recovery. But we cannot set up like little state machines in Kismet to preview this? No. Stuff. Well, in Flowgraph. And we'll come yeah. to that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what exactly do you mean when you refer to something as atomic? And so when you play a fragment, uh, you basically expect the entire content of the fragment, like all your different scopes to be in sync. Yeah. So if you said you want you know, something to start to 0.2 seconds, uh, right now we're not in the, like, in a mind state where you wouldn't want to parameterize this tiny point. Yeah. So th this is like when you start something, you know, you won't start this entire block and not only, or right, maybe only the first track or only the second okay. one. So if, if you want to break things down some more, uh, you're going to need to use some more scopes, but we're going to go through yeah. uh, some examples of that uh, yeah. next. I'll just show again what I, what I said in words before, that a fragment is not just one animation. A fragment is any number of animations. I could put another one here. For my base, my basis. Yeah. Did you just double click or I double click to create the key. I to, to, to create the, the animation. So uh, I'm going too fast. I've been doing this so much. Yeah, sure. So I double click to create a key. Okay. Like in track view. And then you need to give it an animation. Yeah, I need to give it an animation. So I click here to fill in the animation. Sure. I need to browse it, I need to go to it. And then I think it's the same in track view. This is where most of this code comes from. Is double click it to fill it. And you can even leave this open, but I'll close it in a way. 
There is a way to drag and drop from the old character editor, not from character tool yet, but we need to discuss that and see if we can get that back. If you have more monitors, yeah, that was very, yeah, very, that was what very useful. Was ask. Is there yeah. any interoperability yeah. between, and is there any, what's the plan? So, like I said, for character editor, there is a bit of interop. Okay. Um, for character tool, not yet, but it's certainly doable. We need to discuss that a bit. <laughs> yeah, I, that's why I waited for Yevgeny to enter. <laughs> so, something where you can drag and drop from character tool into a clip like this would be amazing. Karim was able to do it in one day, right, with character editor. So, so it should be, it should be five, minutes. five minutes for yeah. that. <laughs> so, um, what are you just doing? <laughs> Just yeah. yeah uh, all right. Pretty low the step there. Right, so now we have two animations playing, one after the other, and this is basically a non-linear animation tool now. <coughs> where we can start playing a bit with the blend times here. Make it slowly blend into that pose and tie the shoelaces. We just figured out that this is not actually a linear blend. It's actually a small curve by default in CryEngine. It's always there. And it's one of the things that animators always ask, can we edit this, can we edit this? But we never really made that. I think that most of the time your blending you know, for interactive animation is going to be pretty short, mm -hmm. like you know something around six frames. Um, and yeah, it's very hard actually to spot the difference on such a short duration. If you go with longer blends, you, yeah, that might make a difference. But so, yeah. In that, that time, you won't notice the difference. But here, yes, obviously, yes. We can add more tracks. We can add another layer here. We can put another animation on here. Is that part of the demo? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. To look around or something like that? Yeah, if you fall. Uh, add not that many and in the right four. Okay. Uh, in case you've got that, mm. the oh. the, the, the crash. Um, slider. Never seen that one. No. It's dragged over the. What was the question? Well, I tried to quickly say that. And you, you want this cross blend in the middle. Um, is there any way to visualize where the first clip ends? Because then you just have the. In this version, the, you'll see the other clip underneath. Okay. Because uh, it's slightly transparent. So you can, yeah, you can actually tweak so that you're, when you overlap, uh, you can actually tweak so that the end of the blend is like a solo aligned with the end of the first clip or yeah. before because if you wait too long you're going to go like to this weird uh when you could pose to any blend where the character seems to stop a bit yeah yeah because yeah, another way you used to have to do it before is align the uh, playhead with the end of the animation then yeah. do that and then put your blend across to you know, We already set it up, by the way, to open up this setup by default. Um, but normally what you do is either you load it yourself here, in your preview setup, or you do it from the, wait a second, before I go in there. There are settings here, in the preferences of the editor, where you can set up the default uh, one. If you're always working on the same one, of course, you go in there and change it. You can also change the size of the tracks, which was yeah, the most requested features back in the day. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, now I need to be really quick. No. So in layers, I clip. <coughs> And 
and you wanted to see how they overlap. Oh, yeah. Remind me the names. Uh, this one was uh, rifle alerted, stand idle. Oh. This one was a uh, tie laces, and the laces was weak around. Oh, need to be careful. Huh? Okay, the good thing is we have footage, so we can we have a nice repro case in there. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to like jump to the animation directly yeah. when you type in the name? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this wrong right now. Mm. So this is still the old character editor's animation browser. Mm. This is the old, the new one already jumps straight, shows I think straight the animations. Mm. Might even yeah. select it right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah the first yeah, one, yeah. and then yeah. probably yeah. just yeah. enter it. Like, don't crash. So that will be the new kind of animation this quicker. Yeah, I'll do that. So See if I drag this over here, yeah, okay. then now Owen can see exactly where the other animation ends and you can nice. Align it. Yeah. So it doesn't apply to looping animations because you can. It's also kind yeah. of snapping yeah. and stuff. Is there a benefit to visually overlapping with transparency on the same track versus just making a new new track? Well, the thing is that uh, each track is directly mapped to an animation layer. So. Ah, okay. I see. So you can do it. It's not a big deal. Typically, you have a couple of tracks to play with. Is it more efficient to just it play will two be animations on one layer? Or well, it, it's like it's uh, internally, it's, you know, animation layers, they have like a rule that uh, typically use different layers to like stack different animations on top of each other. So you, you first layer would like your full body and then maybe you have some layers for some, you know, one layer for your left arm, additive, one layer, that kind of stuff. So typically things that you transfer from one to the next, they would end up being on the same animation layer. So, so an artist would need to be mindful of animation layers uh, if we even would do set of stuff. Exactly. Now, that being said, uh, typically, uh, you know, when designing the mannequin setup, uh, we assign to each scope a certain number of layers. And um, most of the time, like on your full body layer, you would play only one animation or something like that. So this is, you can't really have very conflicting things inside the same fragment because of that. But in that UI, in one layer, when you blend a new animation on, it overrides the joints, whereas if it's on another layer, it additively adds to the joints. So what, what's happening when you put it on another layer sort of depends on how you split the animation. If it's a narrative, that's going to add. If uh, it's not a narrative, that's going to erase the existing joints. But if you have an animation on one layer and an, and an animation on another layer, there's not going to be any blending. This animation is going to basically trump this one when you when you start. Okay. Same if they're on the same layer? So if they're on the same layer, then you're going to get a nice crossfade blending. Now, this is this is what, you know, this is the internals of cry animation. Ah, the crossfade, the curve on the layer below is it taken into account? Yeah. Uh, I, d I don't, I don't no, think that when you start. Not in the same way as you get the, be the correct crossfade if you put them on the same layer. Okay. Otherwise it so in, in theory, in theory, in the UI, you know, we could we could like put them on two different tracks, and so that you can have multiple tracks per layers. But yeah, I mean that could be like a potential different representation. But internally, yeah, for for mannequin, uh, for cry animation, you really blend things inside the same layer, not okay. cross layer. Forget anything. Uh, yes, yeah, the reload. The, and the oh come on! <laughs> Did you save? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need it? You forgot to attach it, I think. Yeah. What is this? Uh, this is the node. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Forgot to attach the entity. Yeah. Yeah. Got this pink thing. Oh, yeah. Th that's why we haven't uh, prepared. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the best one to continue. So I still have to do. Um, so we have wanted to test additives and then show some different types of... Uh, the procedural clip, but yeah. I think we can go with it. Yeah. 
Well, it'd, it'd be good to show me that it is uh, the, the different options we have as well. Word sorting, I can probably talk a bit about um, about scopes and explain a bit more about what they're actually supposed to, to represent. So we, we've so far we've worked with like full body animations. So going from one either animation to an animation where a character is like trying these laces. Uh, but typically in a game, when you when you have like a more interactive environment, uh, you can have multiple things happening at the same time on a on one character. So you know the character might be looking in a different direction, or you might be reloading while running, um, or you know you could be doing a million different things. Maybe if you're running next to a wall, you would have the entire thing where you like put your hand on the wall, and those things. What's happening is that they're basically independent, you know, things that your character are doing at the same time. Your character is basically doing multiple things at once, and we said earlier that like fragments are like you know, atomic, they're like unit blocks you would use to build that. So what we're doing in Manakin is that we're saying we want to have different a way of playing different fragments at the same time on the same character. So you would have like your run fragment running at the same time as maybe your reload fragment. And to do that we use what we call scopes. And scopes are really just a container, an abstract container for those uh, fragments to be played. They can be mapped to the same character, um, to like physically the same character. They can be they can be used to like represent different parts of the character. Maybe you could have a scope, you know, for one arm, if you want, you know, very fine control over that, and say, right, I want to specifically control how this arm is moving independently of the rest of the body using fragments. You, you could do that. You could also use scopes for stuff which is not directly mapped to your joints. Do we have fragments for, let's say, I just used uh, the right arm? Uh, because because there was like full, uh, full, uh, upper body, right? For additives? You could. It's, it's not in the setup we've done for the demo, but in theory, yeah, you, you could uh, you could say, all right, I want to drive the right arm independently from the rest of the body, sometimes, not even all the time. And when that happens, you would like need a different scope. They would say, all right, I'm running on the full body, but the right arm maybe is playing an additive. Uh, yeah, but, but at that point, the additive needs to be uh, stored, uh, animated in the way that just the right arm moves, yeah, right? Yes. Like so you cannot, you cannot mask uh, um, uh, No, right now there's no... Dynamically. Right now, no, we don't have masking, so that would be done at export time. Yes. For it? Yeah. yeah the what? what? So <laughs> graph. Graph entity, yeah, yes. Okay. Maybe let's do a batch of saving everything. I saved the level already? Yeah. yeah. And don't forget the fragment. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me first show you how to yeah. do that. Uh, Jean, the contextual yeah. stuff is, is driving this fragment when you want to do something contextual. How, how is the link that happens? What's yeah, the, so, so typically your game code would exclusively work with fragments. Uh, so whenever you do an action, be it you know, clicking to fire or when you get to a contextual animation, then you're going to have a system that's going to say, well, I'm going to play this fragment. Okay. Are these scopes static? So you define them once? Yeah, the definition of the scope is completely static and it's typically done by the programmer. So the programmer is going to say, right, I'm going to allocate three animation layers to the full body, two animation layers to my upper body, uh, one to the head, um, and you know maybe one for uh, the left arm if you want to do a specific action only for that. So you have a breakdown of those animation layers onto scopes, uh, which is statically done. Right. When I save, you'll see that there, apart from that, there's this mannequin file manager popping up, and it shows you a whole list of files, and you're like, what, I only changed a couple. And it's true. It shows you that you changed that guy, that guy, that guy. And what it also shows is that it loaded all these other files, and what is in memory seems to be not the same as what is on disk. So it means that somebody has been manually editing the file on disk so that it doesn't really match how the editor would save it. We're gonna revise that a bit because it's really annoying that this always pops up. But it, uh, 
what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna undo changes to everything except what I edited. And now I save. So there's generally a lot of uh, these ones. A lot of little, <coughs> a lot of files, or the, yeah. Currently, it already loaded a, a whole bunch of other files so because of the game running in the background too. So what, the, the main reason why you saw all that stuff in there, that could be because maybe a file format changed and uh, somebody didn't re-export everything? Yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, uh, I know a lot of the files we have, but I don't know if you want mannequin files. This, is it the like, Faha, you, Ade, you guys know exactly what files you've changed? Um, That's and a perfect, is it perfect uh, and point because, of course you because on Rice we had this uh, I wouldn't say issue, but uh, it was not very user friendly because mm -hmm. so many people worked in certain stuff. The designers could could talk to each other, but there was no way that ten people could work on. I mean, I mean, how, how is it designed to to support like different artists working on different characters at the same time, mm -hmm. not have conflicting mm -hmm. uh, things with with uh, prep yeah. men and all that crap. So contention is in that can be a big thing indeed, um, meaning that uh, in Rice typically we had like. Uh, Multiple yeah. designers, uh, sound designers, Is it and, and I think, I think this one. one. Just change the sound Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 The so in so Rise, yeah. in Rise, you typically have sound designers, uh, visual effect designers, and um, uh, animators, mostly facial animators, actually putting their their tracks, and system designers working at the same time on the same fragments and so we, we had to like f try and find solutions on a persistent basis on how to you know break the files down so that not everything would conflict. But that's sort of on the, that there is something that sort of has to be sol mm. sold on a case by case basis. Mm. Even though at a system level we could probably, you know, find better solutions. Yeah. And in C three we and also in Rice we already did this to a certain extent. Like we we are able to say uh, certain fragment IDs, like all the idols go into another file than say all the sound stuff or all yep. the hit reactions. So to a certain degree, we, we already did this also in Rise, but yep. there are still a couple of things that are shared and there's contention there. So you, you, can, you can basically break your files down by fragment ID. You can also break them down uh, in a way by scope. So if you have a scope which you're going to dedicate to sound effects, or one of the ones which you're going to dedicate to visual effects, you could like make it so that those are saved in individual files. And this way, your visual artists will yeah, only yeah. work uh, in those files. Are the files ASCII? Uh, yeah, this is tech, yeah. This is XML data. Do they follow like the lay? Are they, well, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> good. I was going to ask if they're mergeable, but that's a different kind of Well, there's sort of... Because like sort layers of are not, like crunch and layers, you'll really, you can really sort of we to You can them. basically merge simple things, like when you change an animation by another one. Okay. Uh, in purple, that's not going to be a problem. But if you like move stuff around, okay. uh, yeah, it's going to be mm -hmm. a whole different we do, thing. Uh, it is a deterministic way of saving, so it will always save in the same way. It's just like, there are a couple of things that can still move things around. If, if you want to make it, um, Makes it really easy to merge, uh, it actually requires a bit of extra thought from the designer, that yeah. from the, the coder that set it up. It is still finicky, so during our productions we always set up code collaborator reviews, just to capture little mistakes uh, that well, can happen. Except in Rice, because we're in such a rush. Maybe, uh, yeah. and you were uh, elite. Uh, <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Fix it again. <laughs> Well, I mean, co contention is indeed a big thing. Uh, it's something we probably need to uh, sit down and think a bit about you know, system level solutions for that. The final thing that I didn't show you yet is this other kind of track here, which you can put in a fragment, which is the procedural layer. And this is the way we can extend the system. We can create what we call procedural clips, not animation clips, procedural clips, that can do whatever we want as programmers. So we can, we have a whole bunch of Types here from eye animation apparently and camera stuff and collision reaction stuff and uh, goes on and on and on and weapons ways and so on. So this is where 
game per game, uh, on a game per game basis, people will decide, okay, we use these clips or we add some more for a gameplay or for a specific camera setup or so on. So there are a couple of basic ones, uh, like a play sound that every game will use or a particle effect, which I can try. Yeah. But there are also a lot of very, very game specific ones, like the weapon stuff. This is specific to the Homefront 2 weapon. In Crisis 3, we had other weapon ones. And in Heroes, or in Whatever we're gonna do, we'll probably have other weapons again, depending on how we're gonna do our weapon setup. To make it as easy as possible for you guys to set it up too. Um, so, just, yeah. And it's specific because it makes assumptions about join names and orientations, or? Uh, no, this is so basically it's a simple framework for game programmers to implement any kind of logic. Yeah, and I meant the pool, I meant the mm -hmm. actual individual items. So the the way you do weapons is very game specific, yeah. and yeah, that's what I meant. it could be. It's not necessarily hard coded join names. It could be, but you yeah, you, mean you you might want it to be like more mm. procedural or more like mission heavy. C two we had a lot of poses that we then in code blended together. Uh, in C three we did it differently with a lot of procedural uh, okay. on top, so we controlled the procedural parameters through mannequin clips. Yeah. Sometimes you have akimbos and you have two weapons and then you need maybe two clips or one clip, but okay. it's very, yeah. But each each thing in that combo box has, uh, it, it, it fills the parameter list, yeah. so you technically could have some more general stuff yeah. if you wanted where you say, hey, jo joints, and you give it the joint exactly. name, and uh, what's my yeah. up axis, or axis delta or something. Yeah. Exactly, so if you look at this one for the particle effect, it's a very generic clip. You're gonna give it the name of a particle effect, the name of an attachment, Except that in this build the attachment is broken, so we won't set that. But okay. there's already a fix for yeah. it. But so y typically, you know, if you have some pretty generic clips, you can put them in the engine, and they're going to be used by awesome. everybody. That's really powerful. Cool. And what's it going? Maybe it this work. Right. It should be able to preview. Yes. yes. Explosion. Yeah. Okay. But because it's on another layer, it doesn't really, even though it has a toe on there, it doesn't really blend in, right? It's just a... This blend in time, it is up to the programmer to decide what he does with this. It is available, so some of our uh, clips take ah, this okay. time and use it, okay. use it to do something. <coughs> and if you want, by the way, I didn't even tell you how to stop looping things. Just add another clip there, or here, and it stops. And then you can... Set the blend out time if you need so. Okay. I'm not sure if the particle effect uses that one. I don't think so. Uh, an, an example in Rise, for instance, I think for the QTEs, uh, you I think the blend in like the blend time was defining uh, how long the initial slow mo was. Oh, okay. Uh, cool. It's really specific to you know what you want to do. And I think that covers pretty much one fragment. Yeah. What you can do with that, and I leave all the complicated stuff to Jean. Yeah, <laughs> now we don't need to return with the crashes. Uh, okay. Let's do that once more. So, uh, so let's say about changes. So again, same thing. Uh, I'm going to ignore all of those um, and just save the gradient things. So right there, we've seen um, how we can set up one fragment and you know various type of operations you can do in there. So you know, sequencing multiple animations, uh, even having multiple layers in the same frag. Oops, in the same fragment. I'm gonna die now. It's recorded. Or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, or even having different type of procedural, uh, you know, things in there. Um, but some uh, another thing which is really convenient is that um, you can, when requesting a fragment, you can let the system um, have some sort of selection process to make more informed decisions about what to play. So what we've defined in there is that we have put uh, an animation where the character is sort of uh, aware that there's an enemy nearby, is in alerted state, and is looking around. Um, but what we could do is say, all right, when in idle, actually maybe he's relaxed and is doing something different. So the way we, we're doing that is by adding like annotations to our fragments. And this is down to what we call tags. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to create a new tag 
which I'm going to attach to like this mannequin setup, which is going to let me know when a character is in a relaxed mood or not. So to do that, I'm going to go to the tag definition in detail. And right there, we see all the tag definitions uh, we have um, in the game. So I'm going to pick the one that we're using right now, uh, which is, uh, yeah, this one. Workshop empty. Yeah. And Workshop. I'm just, on the, on the right side, I'm just going to click this button. Uh, and I'm going to call it relaxed. Right, so when this is done, you see that right there uh, in this part of the UI, those are like the different tags which are available for this character. Uh, so I'm going to talk about those two later on, but you see that right now I have this relaxed uh, checkbox. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, um, I'm going to create a new entry in there, and I'm going to uh, like tag it with this relaxed information so that the game knows more about that. So I just create a new one. So I select it, and then I'm gonna mark it as relaxed. And I just add again an animation in there. Uh, where did it? Yeah, double minus the surface. Big thing for that. And uh, what's it called again? Something relaxed. Yeah. yeah. Rifle pipe. Relaxed and noise on. That's probably the one I'm looking for. And I'm going to make a loop as well. So just playing it right now. Alright, just different stunts for this character. And what I'm going to do now is show in Flow Graph how I can actually use that. So, same setup. I just have the same Flow Graph setup as before. So when the game starts, I want to play. You didn't. Yeah. yeah. Be careful. The idle frame on ID, but this time around, I'm also gonna force this new relaxed tag I just created. So I'm gonna go back to my level. Um, yeah. You. Perspective. They get blended. All the. Yeah. Well, right now I'm just like selecting one. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk over about like transitioning, but right now this is just saying. Instead of playing the normal version, you play the new version I created, uh, which is relaxed. So if I just play right now, you see it's in the relaxed pose. And if I uh, if I remove this relaxed tag, it's gonna be in the other pose. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Explosive move. Actually, let's go back. With, uh, I'm gonna put the debug information back. So you can actually see when I'm playing the normal version. Uh, what is the thing? Yeah. When I'm playing the normal version, you see right there what it's doing. So just playing the idle. And if I go back to the relaxed, you will see in addition there there's like this relaxed uh, tag, which lets you know which state the player currently is. So it, and you also see the relaxed yeah, fragment being selected. You see a different animation yeah, there. The animation. Yeah. It says idle relaxed. Yeah. And again, going, going back to the previous one, you will see. Oops. You will see that the content is different. So you see two layers and this procedural clip in there. So um, going back to mannequin. Uh, so which one is next? Alright, so now, uh, so I, I talked a bit about scopes earlier. Uh, I'm going to show how we can actually use them. So a typical example, very, very common example, is you do something uh, on full body. That would be your, like, your locomotion, how you move. And you would be performing some other stuff on your upper body, like aiming or reloading or doing something. So what we're going to do now is an example where we play an upper body animation on top or a full body one. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm just going to create a new fragment ID, which is going to contain this new, um, this new action that I want to do. And I'm going to call that, uh, I'll just call it upper, upper detail. And this time around, 
you see we went quickly over this uh, window the first time around but you see right there the list of all the scopes which uh, have been defined for his character and this time around I don't want to play on the full body nor on the slave, I just want to play on the upper body scope so I just check this one and in this new fragment ID again I'm going to create a new fragment and you see that this time around uh, the upper body scope is the one I can actually edit with this small uh, like movie icon here so I'm just going to add uh, an animation layer and I'm going to put yeah, got to keep moving things around I'm going to put um, an additive animation in there so I'm going to take the look around animation and I'm actually going to remove it from the remember that mm. in our actual idle uh, fragment we put the additive it probably doesn't belong there it was more for the sake of demo so I'm going to remove it from there and instead we want to drive that in a different way so in my new upper body fragment I'm going to just put like this additive animation as looping and to demonstrate that I'm just going to make a, a simple example where I play this idle animation on the full body and I'm going to play independently the upper body version so just seeing that up I'm going to say after like uh, 3 seconds after starting the first fragment I'm going to start a new one Oops. except that this time I want to play this new upper detail fragment I just created. Is, is, um, is there a, a chooser? Uh, no. Do you have to set a string name? In no, actually not at this point. At this point you have to retype the name okay. of, uh, of your fragment. I mean that, that would be like a neat extension but it's not there at this point. And I'm just going to go back. Yeah, up till now we typically programmed this and then there was other ways to do that. So, Going back there, so what's happening is, uh, yeah, turn it on. So for two seconds, just in this state, and then you see he's playing his upper body on top of that. Okay. And you can actually see the debug information here those two scopes. So the full body is playing like the early stand idle animation, and the upper body is adding on top of that uh, the new animation we've just put in there. Um, so that that's that's obviously a very simple setup. Well, that's typically what your game code would be doing like, based on your player inputs or something like that. So, getting back to mannequin again. So, the next thing we list um, highlight preview. Yeah, the previewer. So, we've been, ma we've been mainly working so far with uh, the fragment browser and fragment editor. So, this is a browser and the editor. But Mannequin also has a built-in tool to let you view a sequence of different fragments. So if I just go into the preview tab in there, I got like a new delicate timeline. And in there I can just put uh, I can just drag and drop different fragments I have from there. So let's say I want to start by you know seeing my character in either relaxed and then maybe is going to the non-relaxed idle after in a couple of seconds and I'm also going to put like the uh, the upper body animation at some point uh, at some point in there and you can use this tool to see both on the timeline and visually what you know, that's going to translate into so I'm just going to do a small section of that so you see going from one to the next uh, actually Let's make that a slightly longer amount of time and move this thing the right click, you can move these yep. red markers around in the timeline. Right, mouse button. So this is just a tool you can use to like preview given sequence of actions. Um, and in that case, you you can actually see that you know maybe the the blending is a bit rough in there when you go from you know from this one to this one. Uh, this is probably something. Um, you you would want to tweak. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically mimic the same you know very similar setup in game, but I'm going to put like some new uh, I'm going to create some new actions for that because we probably don't want to mess around too much with the idle. So 
can you see things like ground alignment and, and, and stuff in here? No. Uh, uh, very limited. Yeah, you, you could. You could. Um, that that would require extra care from, yeah. you know, probably doing that through some procedural flips. But so yeah, then we, yeah. Where do you stop? Is always the problem. Then. Do you then need to import level geometry and all that kind of stuff? I know in Homefront 2 they already do a bit of that, so it could be done. We just assume that it's it's flat. flat. Mm. I mean, we do have a floor. Here. We do have a floor, so we could start adding a slope. I don't mean for that, I mean for like. Um, it was hard for QA to know that when Marius went to kick, um, he did the lamest kick ever. And it like got a D3, and we're like, immediately upon seeing it, I, I knew like. No, no, the, the IK is turned on, it's not his kick, like, but if the animator could give feedback mm -hmm. that this ghost joint actually has IK turned on right now, um, it's because if you were just to drop the animation into character editor, or drop it into an anim object, then you see your awesome kick, but somehow the, the building of the motion mm -hmm. adaption, um, and sometimes it's a very hard move to do, maybe, maybe the kick only happens in one of every six, yeah. um, you know what I mean? Mm. If, if, if it's some kind of motion modifier, it would be cool if they could preview it. Um. What we did in EC3, and some of it is also here, in <coughs> using the on screen debug text. As soon as QA found <coughs> something that was dodgy, they could aim towards a certain character they were interested in, or to the ground, I think, for themselves. Press star, all the information yeah. about all the IKs and everything yeah. would be on screen. They would send the screenshot to whoever. What it meant is they didn't and know that it was a bad asset. It, yeah. it, it took, you know, they just thought it was a weird looking kick. Mm. So, but as an animator, you would know immediately. Same with vaulting. If you remember, we had some vaults where the the, yeah. the, the leg IKEA was on, and he did this weird vault where, I, you know, it, it's uh, an animator would instantly know like, okay, something's wrong. Let me check. But playing that vault in character editor, it looks great. And sometimes that's the only yeah. place that they check. Because they don't want to have to go into an empty level, place a smart object, configure it properly with triggers, do all the things that are needed to test their vault. Yeah. But th this is why this kind of stuff, you know, we, we could in theory come up with uh, a set of uh, tests, maybe something that we would automate, like run every animation in a complex environment. Because I think that going back to Rise, those happen only when the floor wasn't perfectly flat, because uh, flat ground would actually disable alignment. So even previewing that in the context of like the mannequin editor probably wouldn't show you that information. We actually need to try to re level. But we that's a kind of problem we could sort out by automating a test process where you would play that, you know, in various different environments. Um, and you know that we can also that's possible with this like this new uh, this new entity type to some extent. Okay. Could be used for like testing very specific things. Yeah. We, we also run feature tests, it's also a bit tangential to this, but we just have flow graph setups made once and they run every time we make a new build. We we're always thinking about making little videos of those daily or so, so we can review if any of those specific cases fail. But in that sense also the clever automation to, to think about uh, if, if, for instance, with the kick, uh, the system should know. Okay, don't align it because it's like it's like a meter higher from the ground. It doesn't make mm. sense. But yeah, sometimes so it still did it, and that's so also that was also part of the issue. Hopefully, itself. in the future, we'll have some runtime rigging solution to because mm. uh, in the end we yeah. batched. You know, we batched this foot rig where we moved the ghost joint to turn stuff on and off. Yeah. But if we can write a simple Python script to do it, we, think we should be able to do something at runtime as well. I just meant um, it, it can be hard for you guys to see the effects of runtime motion adaption mm -hmm. on your stuff, especially if it's a rare occurrence. But if those contexts or whatever are on a side panel where you can just say, hey, show it to me with this context. Yeah. Yeah, or so what something. if I turn off a certain feature? Yeah. Does it still occur? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so what I've done now is uh, I've just created two new Fremont IDs uh, with two very simple actions. So nothing complex in there. I just create like a new Fremont ID where the character is going to just tie spaces. 
and another one where it's gonna uh, just look around. And what I want to do at this point, I want to play them in a sequence uh, in my level. So, oops, say, uh, uh, I'm confident. But Oh yeah. Continue. Alright, so perspective. And so I've just changed my flow graph to uh, immediately at the beginning play the tie lace animation and after three seconds play the other uh, request the other fragment. And so if I just try that out so we see that the character is starting tight laces, but it's that three seconds last, but it's not looking around. And it's only waiting for the completion of its first animation to do it. And if I start that again, you will actually see in the debug information that right there you have the look around thing that's showing up after three seconds. And what's what's actually happening here is that um, you we have a priority system on on actions so that when you request uh, an animation on a character, it's going to go through a priority queue system, which internally you know, can eventually delay your animations. So, in a, in a typical game situation, uh, you would say, "All right, maybe I have some idle behaviors which are going to be low priority, but if somebody's shooting at me, I want to play a hit reaction, and I want that to be like super high priority. Nothing can interrupt me." So typically your game could be setting up those priorities. But right there, for the sake of testing, we can also, with our flow graph node, uh, change them to see what would happen uh, if somehow the looker, ha the looker around had a higher priority. So I'm gonna, just going to give it a priority of 1 and leave the first one tile laces to 0 and see what's going on when I do that. So you see tiny laces. And after three seconds, immediately uh, play the other animation. So this is something you might want to do if this second animation to look around for some gameplay reasons effectively had to be like super important and it had to absolutely interrupt your first animation. This is probably what not what we actually want here. So I'm gonna give that back a priority of zero but still we might want to control how we go from one to the next and maybe instead of waiting for the end uh, maybe we find a better point in the animation to start blending to the new fragment that I requested Just uh, just one thing in general uh, for Rise for instance uh, did the designers use flow graph for most of the stuff or no, different don't. systems? This wasn't available so everything was done in game code um, So in text editor well, re requesting the animations was all done in game code. Like we had a system for the combat animation, a system for the hit reactions, and all that. And this is typically how you would do it. Maybe for some scripted events, you might want to use that. But typically, you would have a system that would like call a specific fragment ID and set some tags, and then the tags are used to res to you know, resolve that into one specific fragment. But yeah, maybe in some very specific situations you might want to do the flow graph. Like in Crisis 3, it was pretty much like Rice, where most of the things were systemic, like game code, because you needed quick response and you get really uh, detailed control within code of these transitions. But, uh, say, scripted sequences, for those we created specific flow nodes that also not only played uh, the fragments, but also knew how to talk to the AI and shut the AI, the AI down. and. So if, and so on. if you were uh, like let's mm. say an indie developer, you would do more in flow graph, I guess, too. Not not okay. necessarily. So so that's not the place to do logic in that sense. It's it's much. it's more for the sake of testing. You could like do some feature tests with that, but typically uh, the game code is still eventually request something because maybe you know maybe the game code is saying all right my AI character in, is in this state. Maybe the character is performing a contextual action. But if you can have flow graph interrupting that with another fragment and the game code is not aware of that, you could end up in a weird state. So that's why typically you would say, oh, I have a system for my contextual navigation and you just have to feed that with data. But 
the triggering itself, you typically leave that down to the game code. And then that's down to the game code, you know, to make to make a convenient system so we can easily hook new things in. Does the game code how does how does Manikin like an, uh, like interface with animation graph? Does the does the game code modify the animation graph? The animation graph doesn't exist uh, anymore. Manikin is basically a replacement for for that. So the the game code will have its own like internal structure. Sorry, I'm I'm a bit old. Uh, okay. So, so the entire part that was the state machine of animation graph, where you would drag connections and hook up relationships, this is now C++ code. So this uh, basically handling the state is down to your to your code. Okay. okay. Uh, and what you see right there in mannequin, the different Feynman IDs, they could you you can Those think of them as like the uh, partial states. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there anything on the roadmap, future roadmap, to have uh, a user editable state machine again, or that would be more down to the game code? Like in uh, in Rise, uh, we had a state machine in Visio. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah. The, the thing is that the state machine, the, the character state, is actually really tied to the gameplay more okay. than the animation. So you would maybe have controls driving the animation in there, but that's more of a gameplay thing. And right now, Paul is working on a new on a new system to you know get that even further. But that's like sort of orthogonal to your animation state. The animation state is more complex than the game state, typically. Um, so you're getting back to this example where you're tying laces, and at some point, you know, you're getting a request to look around. Uh, Mike actually gives you some ways of um, figuring out when to trigger the transition to a new frame ID. Uh, that can also be used to have finer control over how you want to transition from one to the next. Maybe you want to tweak the blending, and or maybe you want to put some uh, intermediate animations in there. So to do that, you go into the transition editor in Mannequin in this uh, in this tab in there. So I'm just going to resize the windows a bit, and you can see on the left, right there, you know, again our transition browser that right now we don't have any transition. So I'm just going to create a new one by clicking in there, and I'm going to say that when you go from tie laces to look around, uh, you can put some more restrictions on like the transition condition, but I'm not going to do that right now. So whenever you go from this to that, uh, this transition is going to be applied, you see it in the entry right well, there. Those two combo boxes, what were those? They're, they're, so they were showing the different fragment IDs you had. So right now in my character, if I go back in there, you see I have four different fragment IDs, okay. and so those were the one in the combo boxes. Okay. Um, so individual IDs, not um, what are the what's the other word for the not individual tags. All the fragments, but not um, like set to set. No, there, there are so a fragment ID basically can contain many different ah, fragments. Okay. That was my and question. Yeah, okay. those are defined. You go from one fragment ID to another one. Okay, so fragment ID can be a group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it is a group. But an individual fragment is just a fragment. <laughs> An individual fragment is just the set of layers you see right there. Okay. okay. So if you want to go more specific with the transition, you can actually put tags in that window. Okay. Say only when you relax, maybe you can trigger this transition. So getting back to so this way, you can set up transitions in a generic fashion and then drill down for details okay. if you want something specific for a relaxed say. So right there, we can see that uh, we've defined so our custom transition going from this one to this one. And right there, we've got a sequence uh, where we can see both uh, the source and the destination. And a very simple, so I'm just going to play that transition right now. So I'm just going to say I want to stop right there. And I want to start right there. And just watching that. So this is the default blending we have uh, in that situation for that transition. The default blending is set up in the target fragment. Exactly. So you see right there that we have uh, a small blend. This is because in the definition for that fragment, we have a small blend. What I could do in that transition, I could say, all right, I'm actually going to completely disable blending. Uh, so that's going to be, that's just going to pop. Or 
instead I could say, all right, I want to instead like crank up the blend, and you see, I like, just move that one a bit further back, what and it's going to take more time. What then happens in the in the in the engine example that we had going? Is there like a transition flow graph node for fragments? Or? No, so that's the thing. When you define a transition going from one to the other. Uh, in game, every time you go from, you trigger that specific sequence, so you go from tie laces to look around, this transition is going to be triggered. Okay. So you see that right there, the, the blending is smoother, but it's still not very good because what's happening is that you're waiting for the completion of the first animation to go onto the next one, meaning that you effectively finished your first movement, you're in a pose, and then you slowly blend onto something else, which is really not what you want to do. What you want to do instead is you want to start your transition a bit before the completion of the first animation. And in Mannequin you can do that by moving this uh, this small uh, thingy around. So I'm going to say, right, maybe the transition can start a bit before. And so when I get to this point, I'm already starting the blend. Uh, so I'm going to make a short blend because it's still a bit too long. So that's the, yep. the earliest time at which the blend exactly. can so start. But if you only request, like in this example, the transition all the way at the end, it will still not make a difference. Because you do the look around request only around yes. seven seconds a bit later. So it still does exactly the same. If we would do the request yeah. a bit earlier. So um can't sure actually how to do that in the I Sorry. think I move this one. I read one this one. This one? Yeah. So what I can do in the tool is now uh, try to mimic you know what would happen if I triggered that a bit earlier. Um, and I would then want to start the animation a bit earlier as well. So if you s see now, we're actually doing the blending a bit before and therefore it's a bit smoother. Um, mo moving this one around is actually just a matter of, uh, it's just a previewing thing. Uh, it doesn't really change how the transition itself is defined. Uh, so if I go back to my example in game now, uh, <coughs> Would that be a valid way to define, let's say, where combos link and all that stuff? How transitions work, or is that uh, for a high level things so and that's so detailed? That that could be a way of doing that. Uh, for that all depends actually on the number of assets. Uh, and the complexity you, in management. You're gonna get basically you're gonna get the best quality when you can make a decision about where to go next as soon as possible. Uh, the trick with player animation that you only know what the player is going to do when the player presses a button. So if the player presses late, you don't have you know, the same amount of information. Um, of course, so, so that, that would be uh, something for the, may, maybe not for the player or for the player, but also something for AI to say, okay, yep. and here, do this. Exactly. Uh, when you have an AI character, that's, and you want the character to run at a position and then stop, uh, or maybe run at something and, and do an attack, uh, you know ahead of time the entire sequence of events. And therefore, that's going to give you more control because you can say, right, when you get to this point, of then course, you transition. It's deterministic. Yeah. Uh, but for the player, you know, whenever you can, it, it's you can sometimes find ways of still doing things a bit ahead of time, uh, which can help with that. So just getting back to my example then in the, in the level, so just telling the same thing, I don't change anything about the flow graph, but you see that now I'm still requesting the animation after three seconds, and it's waiting a bit, and it's triggering the transition that we've just set up, which means that it's a bit smoother, and it's also triggering a bit earlier. Um, you can also use transitions to, uh, you can actually have multiple transitions to go from one state to another. So what we might want to do is say, right, if the character is like in this, uh, uh, what is yeah, if the character is in this uh, tie laces state, and you request to look around, you know, within two seconds, maybe you want to transition in a specific way. But if you wait five seconds, maybe you want to transition in a different way. You can actually do that in there as well. So if I go back to my transition editor, and you see that this one, whoops, this transition right there. There's something uh, that says select uh, at zero. <coughs> this means that this transition is going to be enabled as soon as you start. This transition is going to be the one that's going to be used um, 
you know, from the very beginning of that fragment. But what I could do is I could create another transition. And I'm going to use the same settings. So going from tile basis to look around, I'm going to say OK. And this time around, I'm going to say, all right, this transition is only getting triggered by, by moving this thing. I'm going to say it's only getting triggered if you wait like uh, four seconds uh, or more. And you can see right there, it actually updated the UI. And you see that I've got a transition that starts at the beginning, and then the one that starts at four seconds. Can you rename those things? Um, and for you not right now, the, the name is, uh, no, there's no name, it's just like the select time and the context. Which, you know, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that, all right, if you get interrupted early in your animation, I'm gonna do something different than if you get interrupted late. And what I'm gonna do actually is say that if you get interrupted early, I'm actually gonna play an intermediate animation in there. So to do that, what what you see in your transition is you got like your source and destination states. And what I'm gonna do is set the destination animation in there. I'm gonna delay this one a bit. And I'm gonna add a new animation clip in between. And so just select this one and I'm gonna pick another animation in my list. Mental breakdown. And I'm also gonna move this uh, earlier start time because if the transition is selected within you know, zero to four seconds, I probably want to branch a bit sooner. So I'm gonna say that the start time is around. That's uh, this, you see this big line, yeah. the red line that brackets the region in which this transition will be selected. Exactly. And if you look at the other one, you see that the pink thing starts where the first one ends. So this is saying that if the transition gets triggered during this interval, during this interval mm -hmm. then that's going to be selected. So I'm just going to put my earliest select time somewhere in there around three seconds, meaning that any transition getting triggered from zero to four is going to use this uh, information. <coughs> so we're just going to test that now in, uh, in game. Uh, so getting back to perspective. And so if you look at the flow graph I did in there, I said after three seconds, you trigger the transition. So three seconds is uh, smaller than four, therefore the first transition is gonna be used. And uh, if I just play it now, you see it's times three races. And after three seconds, it's going to a mental breakdown because this is the first transition I've defined and then uh, looking around. Now, if I put the waiting time to uh, 4.5 seconds, that's gonna be uh, the second transition which is going to be used and looking at it so we see the animation is queued but it's going to wait for the other uh, point we had and just based on when you query things uh, therefore you can get like different outcome so this is all a bit abstract but you have to imagine that maybe you're playing a long animation and the player can interrupt at various points First, you don't want to interrupt right away. You might want to wait for specific output points, uh, and this is how you would do this yeah. kind of thing. With you you cannot call any of these things. Uh, you just did in mannequin in Flowgraph, like so. In Flowgraph, what you're doing right there is you're just saying I want to go from this tile aces to look around. Yeah, well, but I mean, like the whole setup you just said, like from from the, in this time range, I want you know when I trigger another animation within this time range, I want this to be played. You, you, could, you could script that in Flowgraph, but the, the, if you script something like that in Flowgraph that's very specific you know, to your level or to your situation you're doing, mm -hmm. the whole point of doing that in Mannequin is you could define that maybe you have like a move to right or transition, and maybe if you're on the left foot, you want to wait. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I just, yeah. I'm, I'm, for me, this is like no base would be so much easier to grasp. Than, uh, uh, like, all right. Like, but it's just, I mean, it's probably yeah, just it's also getting used to it, I guess. Yep. So. Uh, so let me get back to this one. It's probably uh, a matter of how we represent the UI. Because, so getting back to our transition editor. So what what you see in there, like the source and destination, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty straightforward, and then you just get some filters. But yeah, this there might be like different ways to maybe. Yeah. Uh, in the UI. 
it's not as straightforward as just some states and lines between them. That's the maybe yeah. we can figure something out. Yeah, to make it a bit more visual. <coughs> and also the fact that I could not be descriptive and say, okay, uh, the first one is mental breakdown, the second one is mm -hmm. isn't. Because uh, <laughs> also yeah, yeah. If, if someone else who, who didn't work on that opens it up, you, you don't get any information. You need to double click and check. And, yeah. So, I mean, th this one is a bit of an extreme example because if you put like an intermediate animation, you would probably do that on most of your transitions or something like that. But yeah, I, I, I get I get your point about that. Maybe we can think of ways to 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 improve the UI. Uh, oh yeah, if that. you have like mm -hmm. maybe the, the opportunity to do this node based, but it would still in the end like just this this little function you just did or this condition actually mm -hmm. with this uh, thing. Yeah. But it would still like translate to a mannequin in the end. Uh, you know, it's just a different way of working, man. It's probably not worth the effort. Well, know. right now the selection from one uh, from one fragment to the other, uh, the only like dynamic condition there is, uh, is based on time. Uh, the other thing is, you know, what your source state and your destination state. So we only have like one possible filter hmm. uh, right now, which is sort of why we're just showing them in this like linear fashion. Did we use this uh, at Rise, or is Homefront using this extent? I think on I think Homefront on is using this yeah. extensively. Okay. I think on Rise I used it for some very specific things. Uh, I think for contextual actions I used that. Can't remember all the details though. Um, but I used it only yeah. for like, going from smart objects back to movement or something. Like that. Yeah. Relatively basic stuff. Um, I mean, in a real life situation where you, you have like your gameplay would be like different systems, like in Rise, you know, you have the combat system and the locomotion system, and you would more define transition going from one system to the next, and you pretty often you wouldn't need that granularity, or you would put like something saying, right, if I go from something left foot to something right foot, I'm gonna put the transition in there. So uh, I think that most of the time in Rise, at least. Um, what we are doing was more based on uh, either the uh, fragment IDs, source and distribution fragment IDs, or some tag information, which is basically giving you some context information. So, but you would define that in code then, or how, how did it work on Rise? No, so the, co the code would say, I want to go from this state to that state. So but that, that, that's not exposed to animators to work on, on, on that? No, the, the code would say, well, I'm, I'm currently running, and I want to do an attack. Uh, because the player has pressed the attack button. So what the system would do is say, all right, I want to go to my run fragment, to my uh, attack fragment. And internally, that would, like, mannequin would try and find a transition for that. And if nothing, you know, if, if there's no suitable entry for that, it would just use, like, the default uh, transition, which is what you define in your attack fragment. But is, is this something, then, this transition editor, something we're going to use for the next project as well, to expose those things for animators to work on blends? Well, I, ideally, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, whenever it's possible to queue things up front, uh, this is when, you know, the transition editor can really be of best use. In Rise, like, we use transitions for all contextual uh, navigation. When doing a contextual action, uh, the player can basically either press forward with a joystick or not, and that will result in like different transition leading out of your movement. Like when you're vaulting over an obstacle, you don't want to stop your animation before starting your run again. So this is where we would like use that. But yeah, the if you want to get better animation quality of your transitions, uh, this is like definitely a good uh, a good place to express those you know, time-based conditions or context-based uh, <coughs> selections. The idea is also if you want anything more comp a very complicated condition, you would then make a new tag for that, and you would then from flow graph or code or wherever you do your complicated condition, you would set the tag and then trigger yeah. a new back yeah new yeah. But the thing is, we, we can only test it once the code is already there. Then right, I mean, that's not like. Huh? But with this flow note, you with, with the pretty yes. much do. So let's let's everything the code can well, let's take an example. Well, yeah. You could simulate yeah. it, yeah, and yeah. then just make a sequence yeah. and press play, and mm -hmm. then he just does it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. A little bit, yeah. 
Well, the thing, let, let's say, for instance, the player can be only in relaxed state, and at some point in the development of the game, it is decided that the player can also be in, um, how do we call that, uh, alarmed uh, state. Uh, what, what that would typically do is we would just change a tag on the player, uh, on the fly, and so right, you're not, uh, you're not relaxed anymore, you're alarmed, and this would internally trigger like a state change. So you would go maybe from your idle relaxed to idle alarm, and you would just have a normal blend. But if that's not good enough, you could say, well, I want to do a transition. And even if the code isn't ready there, uh, the code that's gonna you know just say, right now I'm in the alarm state, therefore I set this tag, uh, you could still like define your transition independently from that and test it. Uh, so the, the basic there. idea behind this is that the programmer sets up, or a game programmer sets up the basic states of the game, the structure of the character, the structure of the game, and then animators can go in and add style to it, add flavor to it. Mm -hmm. That's why the name mannequin was chosen. It's a bit like a puppet you start dressing up. And so the coder defines there is a idle move, an idle break or something, and then animators can go in and make many variations for idle move and so on. They can even define how to transition from one to another. Mm -hmm. But by default, it would already work. Game programmers are happy. And then animators can go in and mm -hmm. add the style. So Rise wasn't a good example for that, because for quite a few systems, we were so rushed in that I ended up doing like a lot of the mannequin setup. Mm -hmm. Like the, the player locomotion, for instance, when we've added the aware state, where the player is still freely running around, but with the shield a bit raised, uh, that was actually that was actually me going over and saying, oh, right, let's use that. Maybe let's transition this way." But that's clearly not optimal pipeline because you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I won't do that as good as an engineer would. And um, I mean, also you don't have the time. Yeah, I mean, that's Ex exactly. We, we were like five, eight animators, whatever. Yeah, we we, we had like one animation programmer. Yeah. So so hopefully you know we're proper uh, we're proper so these kind of things can be decided up front uh, in a better way so that you know state changes can be made more independent. I mean, the mm. visual aspect of the state change can be more independent from uh, the actual game logic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also imagine that m many of the states will be defined within the, uh, the stuff that Paul is working on. Like yeah. It's a bit of a hope or a dream, but it's like a blueprint system, mm -hmm. like a real blueprint. Yeah, yeah that, that's actually what I was yeah. asking you looking yeah. for because this is really yeah. handy to test. So you can test you it could under do gameplay conditions yeah. without code, that's what I meant yeah. before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, we could do that in RISE uh, through the Visio state machine and Blueprint, the system Paul is working on right now, is like the next generation next version of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Visio. Which happened to have the same code name as the Unreal yeah. thing, which does the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. But we had the code name Please. before. Yeah. Yeah. We had the code name before. Okay. So you didn't sue them. <laughs> well, um, pause and see. What? Next section is synchronized animations, but if you want, we can take a small break or just continue. Uh, next question? Yep. Uh, what's the context? Is, there, is it just a character? Context? Uh, do you uh, want to find out this is a very good question. We actually didn't I use know. that at all on Rise. Therefore, I'm not 100% sure mm -hmm. of uh, what this does. Uh, this I can explain that later. It's yeah. it's not that complicated, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Basically, defines here which animation database you use and which entity is displayed there. I mean, th yeah, that, that's sort of going to tie with uh, the synced animations. Um, so you want to take a small break or yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's not take that much in one minute. Yeah, it's probably fifteen minutes left uh, in total. Well, then you can also finish on yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's write it then. All right. So that's it for transitions. I'm going to talk now about how to set up synchronized animations uh, in Mannequin. So, just animating multiple characters at a time and sequence all of that uh, all in one place. So um, the first thing I'm going to do again is just create a new fragment ID for my sync dining. And this time around, in my list of scopes, I'm going to say, well, I want to work on full body. And I also want to work on the slave character. So I'm going to leave slave. I don't care about upper body. So I'm just going to remove that one. And let's just create this one. So I have my new uh, fragment ID in there. 
and what I'm gonna do is I'm create I'm gonna create a new fragment which is gonna be what I want the like the host of the mm -hmm. scene to be playing. But I'm also gonna create a fragment Sorry. for what I want the secondary character to be doing. And in order to know which one is which, I'm gonna put a tag on um, on this one to say all right, one of them is gonna be on scope slave. And this tag is typically something that the programmer would have defined already in the list. Uh, so this way I know that one of them is playing on the host and one of them on the slave. Um, in addition to that, I also need to set a context tag, which is going to let me know um, which type of other character I'm going to be playing that with. This is currently a concept that is a bit fuzzy, so we want to clarify that a bit. Uh, for, the, for the sake of the demo, I'm gonna, just going to say that I will so use... added re recently in Homefront 2, yeah. uh, specifically for the cinematic setup, which they're doing here. But for this simple example, it's a bit overkill. But yeah, for, for this example, we're just going to set it up. This is something we want to simplify. Um, yeah. Right now, unfortunately, we have to we have to set it up. So now, uh, now that I've preserved my fragments, I can see in my timeline in there that I can drive the full body scope and also the slave scope. So I'm just going to add an anim layer to each one of them and just put some animations in there. So the first one is going to be um, looking around. So just use the same animation. And the second character I wanted to use is binoculars. And uh, yeah. And so I can try and play that right now in the in the editor. And that's gonna look a bit weird because both my characters are at the same position. Uh, so it's probably not what we want there. Uh, even for previewing purposes, that's not very convenient. So what we can do is we can actually edit the previewing setup for that so that the characters are not in the same position. So to do that, I'm just going to go in File, Context Editor. The context is what we're using in the editor to preview the scene. And I can see right there my two characters. So 3P is the main one, and Slave uh, is the secondary character. And I'm just going to double click on that one and say, right, I want you to be like at a different position, so 2 on Y, and I'm going to pivot you by 180 degree on Z. And now yeah, if I play again the same uh, the same thing in there, I can see that the characters are now in different positions. Um, please note that this is really like a previewing thing. There's nothing that's forcing the characters in the world to be at that specific position. That's not going to be in the, in the game. Like exactly. This is more convenience uh, for the sake of previewing. If you want your characters to be like in a proper position, you would do that with procedural clips or you know using slave joints or you know there are many different techniques. That's all going to depend on how strict you want this alignment to be. That's going to be somehow game specific. Um, so now what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set that up in the level editor because I want to be able to see that as well. So getting back to the level editor, what I'm going to do is I need another character, so I'm just going to copy this one around, and yeah, I'm just probably, probably don't want to be in this one yet. So I'm just going to put it in a different position, and I'm going to edit my flow graph now. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is when I copy the other character, it also copy the logic. I, I want only one logic, I only want flow graph, so I'm just going to remove. Uh, this graph, which I don't want, and I'm just going to make my small script in there. So i just remove all the logic we had so far. And the main thing to do here is to use the enslaved character for graph node. And what this is going to do is, this is effectively going to say, I want this character to be attached to that one. So I'm just going to point that. So Send the graph entity, and I'm gonna say this one. Uh, uh, this character goes in there, and just gonna tie that together. 
And when enslaving, you also need to give you the context. Uh, the, the context is what, what you call context is basically what you're going to be binding to scopes. We mentioned earlier that a scope can be upper body or full body, or maybe right arm and left arm. You can actually have multiple different characters, and that we would like to say that each character has a different context. So I'm going to say that this second character, I'm going to attach it to a slave scope, and a slave scope is actually using a context called slave. So this is typically stuff that would be done by the game code. I mean, there's a bit of complexity in there we need to expose, but there would typically be a very limited number of contexts. So uh, that's again going to be game specific, uh, this part of the setup. And so what I want to do is, so when we start, I want to enslave so this character to that one. And when that's done, I just want to play. Oops. Uh, when that's done, I just want to play again uh, my syncing fragment on the host, and this is sync adding. And let's try that right now. And it doesn't work because I probably forgot. Yes. So what I forgot to do in there is to give the context tag. Mm. Uh, you remember I said that the context tag is going to define. Uh, it's going to give you some information about what you want to, uh, what you know, other character you want to be using for that animation. I forgot to put it in there, so just add it. Context slave. Again, this is part of the stuff we want to simplify this context tag. So hopefully we'll find a simpler solution uh, soon. And let's try that again. And now, yeah, you can see the sync animation we've defined is being played right there. So they're still like doing things which look independent because not you know synchronizing mm -hmm. position and all that. But the idea that you're still defining your scene in only one mannequin setup and with this like photograph logic you actually attach them together and say, right, I want you to be bound to this scope so that I can drive everything in one place. And this is basically how we did executions in Rise, uh, which had like many, many scopes. Uh, this is the same. Uh, Core uh, system, really. Yeah. Um, in, in Crisis, a similar system was used for weapon animations. Although then that weapon was always attached to the other character, mm -hmm. to the nano suits. Again, there are two different characters to the engine, but they're attached to each other by system, and animators would animate them in sync <coughs> as if they were one animation. So as an example, mm. when you reload, you're gonna have, you're gonna have the, the arms animation, yeah. and you also need to animate the weapon, like take the mag off and yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, and so that that again will be done by game code, not by flowgraph. Really, the ability to do in flowgraph is more like for testing, or if you have some very very specific scripted events, or maybe background objects which you can't really interact with, because uh, chances are using that on real characters, that's gonna mess up the AI or player code. They're more like a convenience for testing. Uh, and that's sort of conclusive uh, for us synchronizing animations. So that so flow graph is nothing you would you would do too extensively in the game anyway. No, maybe you know if you, I, I wouldn't even say for prototyping stages. Maybe for animation prototyping, not for gameplay prototyping. Yeah. Maybe in this case, it's a bit like an anime object. So a background object that is doing very simple interaction with the player. Go ahead, I would say, and do a. I think we might use that for some feature tests to make mm. sure that you know everything works fine because that's like a nice way to do stuff without having to load a player or an AI. Uh, so that you know, that's nice to have this, this ability. 